this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. We're going to talk about someone who meant a great deal to us. Here to introduce our guests, Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Mel Gusso was a longtime cultural critic and drama critic at the New York Times. He was a good friend of this show, was on many times. To talk about him, we have two of his colleagues from the Times, Ben Brantley and Charles Isherwood. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Um, Mel Gusso, um, drama critic for, gosh, almost 30 years or so at the New York Times. What was his impact, Ben? Starting in the 1960s, um, I edited a, uh, a book of Times reviews, the New York Times Book of Broadway. Um, <clears throat> and it was fascinating going through, From it was all through the 20th century. As soon as Mel arrived, the, he opened a door to a whole kind of theater that the Times hadn't been covering before. Mm. And um, it was a moment where that sort of theater was electric and what's called off-off-Broadway. But suddenly these names, like Sam Shepard uh, and um, uh, the Living Theater, are being introduced courtesy of Mel. Um, and um, there was, it's such an important part of the mix and yeah. has remained so. And um, he, I, he was a, yeah. he was an interesting character though in the sense, Charles, to be the person who discovered Off Off Broadway. I mean, he was a, almost professorial Mel, mm -hmm. really, you know, or could have been a, maybe even a Wall Street businessman. And yet here he was going down to, you know, Cafe Chino and places like that, seeing mm -hmm. early Edward Albee plays. Um, your sense of him as a, as a, as a critic and the impact he had? Well, I, I didn't know him very well. I was sorry that, you know, he wasn't well by the time I joined the Times. But uh, it's true that, as Ben says, he brought this, you know, the voice of a major institution, which had sort of been ignoring a, a whole aspect of the theater. Uh, he brought this attention to something that turned out to be one of the most important trends in, you know, modern theater. And I, that was a pretty vital thing to be doing. And I think he really, for, you know, just think, speaking personally, I think it's wonderful that he created of the job of, you know, sort of off-Broadway critic, a really important, mm -hmm. uh, turned it into a really valuable tool and made it, you know, a very respectable position, which I now hold. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, here is uh, Mel Gusso. Mel, welcome back to Theater Talk. It's Good always to be here. a pleasure to see you. Uh, Mel has uh, been doing a series of remarkable books, uh, Conversations with Harold Pinter, Conversations with Beckett, Conversations with Stoppard, and the latest one, Conversations with Miller, with Arthur Miller, and we're going to talk about that tonight. Um, how <laughs> conversations with, these are conversations that have been going on with you and Arthur Miller for, for years, right? Well, for almost 40 years, actually. For 40 years, mm -hmm. yeah. Where is he in his life, reflecting in this book, back on it, at his plays? Is he still a vigorous playwright, or is he sort of winding down? Very much a vigorous playwright. I mean, he just turned 87, and, uh, he is still writing, has had a new play, as you know, at the Guthrie Theater this year, and has several ideas for other plays in his mind. He's just never stopped. I mean, other, other playwrights have a long sort of interval. Arthur Miller's always been out there, and, uh, and consistently, uh, I would say, of a, of a certain high quality. Not all the plays are as good as the other plays, right. but, uh, but he's really uh, very much writing in the 21st century. He is kind of the workhorse of the great American playwrights in, in, in some ways. Well, he certainly is. I mean, you contrast him, for example, to Tennessee Williams, I mean, uh, absolutely one of our great playwrights. But in his last years, he just really couldn't finish a play, certainly not finish a play to his own satisfaction, mm -hmm. that they were, they were sad years. With Arthur Miller, there's, there's no let up, there's no let down, mm -hmm. and he just keeps, uh, keeps going on. Well, well your, your first conversation was with him when he was doing After the Fall back in... What, this was 1963, when, yeah. the, uh, when the Lincoln Center Theater was first starting. I first uh, met him very briefly at the time. We had a, a small conversation. Uh, I always remember the, that initial meeting because it was on the set of After the Fall and had these sort of modular units representing uh, various things, including the marital bed of the two lead characters who were based on Arthur Miller and Marilyn Mar Monroe. Who had just died when that, not when he wrote it, but when it, ironically as, when it was yeah, produced. A, she as he died. was finishing it, she, mm -hmm. she died. There was a crossover. But in any case, when I first met Miller, he was lying back on this modular unit representing the marital bed and seemed a man completely at ease with himself, with his past, with Marilyn Monroe, as it were. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I thought, as, as the years passed, as I got to know him better, it, it was a misconception, a misperception, really? that he really w was not at peace with all these, that he had great feelings going on all the time about it. And, and, and all this, uh, uh, it's, it's turmoil and also uh, great emotion does get into the plays, got into After the Fall, as a right. matter of fact. But in this book, in these conversations with him, I'm, I'm struck by the kind of detachment from this turmoil that he often has when he when he talks about it with you. Um, I, I guess, does that emotional upheaval just come out in the plays? Uh, well, you have to realize that so many of his plays really are very serious, like Death of a Salesman, uh -huh. after all, drawn partly from his own life. Right. 
but, but uh, something does go on, something transpires when he sits down and writes the play. In conversation, he's, well, for one thing, he's not a pompous figure. And sometimes mm -hmm. I think people who haven't liked his work as much as I and other people have would think that he had a certain sort of removal and pomposity, but he doesn't at all in his own life. And actually, he doesn't in his plays either. The plays speak for themselves and speak for Arthur Miller. Mm -hmm. um, you, you tell us that, that his, the two greatest events of his life were the Depression, which so informed many of his plays, and the blacklisting, the uh, McCarthy trials. And it's amazing to me how much he talks about those themes in, in these conversations. Well, well they, they really were uh, formative moments for him as a man and also as a playwright. I, mean, I think the uh, Depression certainly had a lot to do with Death of a Salesman, with this whole dream of, of uh, you know, American prosperity, which was a failure. And certainly the McCarthy hearings had an awful lot to do with The Crucible, his, other, huge, uh, his, his other great play. Uh, and I think they, that it, he's thought about both a lot. They personally affected him, but also in terms of his art. They were really, really crucial events. He seems to me now, and I, his, his new play, which was out in Chicago, what, what was it called? Um, uh, Resurrection Blues. Resurrection Blues. And in interviews I read with him, and in sort of the, the later interviews, a kind of bitterness, though, and, and, and a sourness about um, American society and culture today. Do you find him that way? I, uh, I would say more a disappointment rather than a sourness about mm -hmm. it. And although I haven't seen Resurrection Blues, it is, after all, it's, it's a comedy. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one aspect of Miller that's always been overlooked. <laughs> yeah, well, do you like it? Do you think humor works in his plays, though? Do you sometimes, sometimes not. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a play like The Price, the character of the, of the old uh, antique Very, yeah, dealer great, Solomon yeah. is, is one of the you know, great comic characters yes. on the American stage. Yeah. Comedy is you know, one finds more in his own life, I think, than on stage. Mm -hmm. He hasn't always uh, felt that was his proper mode, though he has written, uh, you know, comic moments into many of the plays, mm -hmm. or even passing scenes when Willie Loman is funny. I can't remember too many comic moments in The Crucible. <laughs> no, no, no. But <laughs> the Last Yankee was, a, I thought, it was kind of in a failed attempt, though, at uh, trying to have some comic elements in it. Yeah, well, that that could be said, I think. Yeah, um, I want to go back to this point, though, disappointment. Uh, is it disappointment in the potential for what America could have been uh, and what it has become? Yes, absolutely. Uh, one must remember that he is a very political person and a very political playwright. Mm -hmm. Even when the plays might not seem overtly political, they all are. And I think it is this great disappointment in, in uh, you know, what's happened uh, not only to our country but to the world itself. And, and he just cannot stop talking about politics because it does really rule his life. And, and as a man, he's taking so, so many steps to, to rectify what he can, I mean, through, through Penn and other organizations. He's always out there in the front lines, mm -hmm. speaking out against censorship, against repression of any sort. Uh, and, and he's very much, uh, very naturally, a, a spokesman for, for those of us who be, feel very strongly about civil liberties and freedom. Mm -hmm. I want to tap into your general knowledge about the theater and about um, political playwriting, because I think you're right. I, I think in some ways he is the most important, um, uh, not only one of the greatest playwrights, but the most important political playwright in this country. But aside from Tony Kushner, I don't see a lot of playwrights uh, after Miller picking up on political themes and being as overtly political in their writing as Miller and, and, and Kushner are. Why do you think that is? And well, first of all, it, it's more true in England. I mean, playwrights like... They're more political in England. Right. Yeah. Uh, Pinter, Stopper, David Hare. Hare, all... Just yeah. three are yeah. terribly uh, political. In America, I don't know exactly why they haven't... I mean, there are political moments in plays by Edward Albee, mm -hmm. uh, Sam Shepard, and the David Mamet, for that matter. But it isn't quite the same thing. And I'm not sure exactly why they don't reach to that, that Miller has felt this uh, great sort of uh, conscience and, and uh, you know, consciousness about what's going on. I, I thought it was uh, interesting, in one of our talks, when he began talking about uh, Tennessee Williams, mm -hmm. that he felt there was a political dimension to Tennessee's work. Right, right. As he analyzed it, Cat in Hot Tin Roof, for example, mm -hmm. is, is about... Well, about the economics of its time, mm -hmm. to a certain degree. It's a personal family play, mm -hmm. but after all, Big Daddy is dealing with, uh, with major issues at the same time. Mm. Yeah, very and he felt, even though Williams wasn't overtly a political playwright, that he, too, had a sense of politics and it would get into his plays. And I think that's also true of these other playwrights that I, I mentioned, including uh, you know, some of the younger ones, like uh, oh, John Robin Bates, uh, Susan Laurie Parks, mm -hmm. uh, that there are political elements, haven't yet perhaps emerged as strongly as they have with Arthur Miller. One thing, too, I guess that's changed, and I'm struck by uh, him as a, as a political figure in here, 
he, his, his work resonates, of course, beyond the theater. And you really feel that, you know, he is a leader in some of the great political battles, particularly in the 50s of his time, in a way that I'm not so sure artists can be anymore. Um, you know, when Arthur Miller wrote The Crucible, it was discussed and debated in the uh, uh, important political, intellectual journals like The New Republic and all that. Tony Kushner writes a political play, and it doesn't seem to have the kind of impact on the culture that Miller's plays did. Is yeah, that but it has tremendous impact in the media. Yeah, I, I, I would think in a way maybe you're underestimating Tony Kushner. Yeah. When, you, when you think of Angels in America, for example, yeah, it, it right. was a very pivotal play in mo modern theatrical history, I think, and uh, Homebody Cobble the same way. That I think he certainly is one who's in that line is following in Miller's footsteps. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. you're absolutely right about the fact that other American playwrights haven't necessarily put politics first in their, in their plays. Or is it harder for the ones that do to get recognized and to get to the commercial level? Well, that's possible, too. Yes. Yeah. What do you say and what does Miller say about um, criticism often leveled at him that um, he sort of has a, uh, a, a tin ear for the language, that the, the, it's kind of a pedestrian writing, it's not poetic the way, say, Tennessee Williams is. It was a criticism, I think, that Eric Bentley often leveled at him in the 1950s. Well, he, he, first of all, he does not have a tin ear for the language. It's true he's not poetic in the same sense that Williams was, but Williams was, after all, he was, he was the poet playwright mm -hmm. of our theater. That, that's not uh, Miller. Right. But Miller has a gift of language, and I think it's been underestimated. And I think he feels very sort of defensive about it when it's, when it's brought up, because it's, it's quite true that he can write, and he also can, uh, can, can speak. I mean, he's, uh, you know, he's a marvelous talker, along with uh, being a very good uh, playwright. Mm -hmm. When you're looking back at this 40 years of a relationship with Miller, how has he changed the most profoundly? Uh, what, what, what one aspect would you say, ah, uh, this is so different, aside from he's an old man then and he was a... Well, that's, that's a hard one to answer. Uh, certainly, I would say he has a longer view than he had before. That, that uh, initially the plays came much more directly out of his own life, and, I think, and later on he's been looking for other subjects. And, and as he's done that, he perhaps has, a, has had a broader view of what he's doing. Uh, it, it falls in the middle of his career, but I think a play like View from the Bridge is very crucial, because in a sense he was, he was thinking about, I don't know, there, there was Greek tragedy over his shoulder. Right. Uh, I mean, the, the, the same way when, when he did his adaptation of Enemy of the People by Ibsen, he was thinking in sort of grander terms. But also, as I just said before, not to be underestimated is his not only gift of language, but also his, his humor, mm -hmm. which, which does, uh, does spark up in, in, in those plays and, again, very much in his uh, personal life. Is there a particular play of his um, that uh, is not as well known as some of the others, but that you think has been given short shrift and should, you know, is worth a look for the roundabout or Lincoln Center the, to, to, to resurrect and do? Well, certainly it's true that After the Fall is, is the one play of his that I don't think has ever really gotten a fair shake, mm -hmm. uh, and, and maybe never will, but I think that that's one play that he perhaps also feels one of these days it really will have the production that it absolutely deserves. How about Incident at Vichy? Well, I was going to say that. That, that, was, that was the other one. In fact, there's some talk about maybe doing that again, and I think that's a play that could really stand a, a, a second look. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks a lot for being our guest tonight on Theater Talk. Thank you. It's time to take your vow If you come with me now I'll show you how Oh, wow <laughs> We have our two favorite performers from Broadway's biggest hit Oh, come on, cut out the surprise. Look like, oh, who oh, was? Oh, oh, you really? Oh, oh, someone's come on. noticed us. <laughs> oh, you two are a caution. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a break. Yeah. Yeah. That's very sweet. Come on. Coming out of that. That's very sweet. Yeah. That's you very know, you go, to see, you. you go to see Spam a lot because you've heard Hank Azaria's in it and David Hyde Pierce and Tim Curry. You walk away from Spam a lot saying, my God, Sarah Ramirez and Christopher Sieber are the funniest things oh, in the show. Thank, thank you. you. Welcome to Theater Thanks. Talk. Thanks. It's nice to be here. Great to be Huzzah. here. Huzzah. Yes. <laughs> So uh, this looks like uh, it just must be great, great fun to perform this kind of show. Absolutely, every night. you're playing the it's lady in the lake, the lady of the lake, who sort of threads her way through. The whole yes, she does, and thing. she's uh, you know a big supporter of King Arthur mm -hmm. and all his various <laughs> missions throughout. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. and, so. and Christopher, you're playing. I play several people. Several people I play, as well. I, I, uh, which a lot of people don't realize. <laughs> it's, it's very strange. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm Dennis Galahad, who turns into Sir Dennis Galahad. He's ah, yes. transformed by the Lady of the Lake. Yes. And then I'm Sir Galahad for Act One. And then in Act Two, I become the Black Knight, mm -hmm. where I get my arms and legs right, cut off. Right, right. But I'm covered in the head and a mustache and all this stuff. People kind of realize it's me. They go, oh, I did that's that frankly, but I'm <laughs> Okay, see? Yeah. And then the second, the third character I play is uh, Prince Herbert's father, which is, you know, I'm, I look 11 feet tall. I'm covered in 45 pounds of fur and, and blankets and, and a beard and a mustache and this balding, balding wig. And, and it takes, the, the scene is about maybe 10 minutes long, maybe 15 minutes long. And about seven minutes into the scene, everyone goes, Oh my God, that's Christopher Sieber. Yeah. Oh my God, which is a compliment and a slap in the face all at the same time. You're like, well, read your play, Bill. I'm right there. Yeah, so. Now, Sad, if I'm not mistaken, your role sort of developed uh, as the play kind of uh, got going, didn't it? I mean, were you always the, this prominent in the show? Well, uh, originally, yeah. When I accepted the the job, I hadn't read the script, so it wasn't clear what the role was exactly. But it was the Lady of the Lake, and then it turned into two separate. Well, it was two separate tracks for two different women, and then they had me take on the second track. Um, but then that ended up going away after Chicago. Mm. So then it came back to the Lady of the Lake and what she does. So um, yeah, it's sort of come full circle back to what I originally was doing. Well, because what I heard, though, is that you were so funny that they keep wanting to give more, they wanted to give more and more to you in the rehearsal Well, process. I mean, I did, I did hear Mike say once, like, she wasn't supposed to be funny. And that kind of surprises me, because when I heard the music, I laughed immediately. Yeah. I thought, oh my god, you know, there's all these genres that we're paying tribute to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's sort of whatever, whatever. I would like to call and, it a tribute. Um, yeah, yeah, a, right. a, we'll a tribute. call it a tribute. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I, I laughed my butt off about it, so I found it very funny. Mm -hmm. um, now, so Mike, just, of course, is our good friend Mike Nichols here. Yes, yes sir. Give us a sense of working with him. He may be possibly the best uh, director of uh, comedy out there today. What does he bring out of you? I mean, well, you're naturally funny people, but how does he shape the performance? Well, it's, it's, it's funny because, you know, first of all, you have to get over the shock that you're working for Mike Nichols. Yeah. Yeah. And once you do that, because he is really, I, I always use this term, one of us. He's like a normal person that is completely approachable and nothing but supportive beyond belief. Support, mm -hmm. support, and laughs. At, at your same jokes, even after he's heard them 3,000 times, he still laughs at the jokes, which is very good. Um, but also, uh, it, it was a very bizarre, because I came into the show, um, Doug Sills decided to leave, and right. so I came in to replace him. And I Says was diplomatically. I, I, it was it's true, but I, I had to kind of like I call it kamikaze act, mm. which is actually <laughs> absolutely perfect for our show because yeah. you kind of have to throw yourself into every sketch or every scene or every song that we're doing it's kind of just like let's go see what happens and mm -hmm. just be funny mm -hmm. and uh... that's Mike, exactly what you did and that's what i did and, just, and little did so i know impressive. that that was perfect <laughs> little did i know so I, was, I was on the right track and and uh, mike mm -hmm. uh... and i thought for a while because i wasn't getting any feedback except from other actors and everything um, and and uh... i thought I'm I'm going to be fired too. <laughs> I'm going to. I don't know. I have to. Remember, Doug Sills left on his own. Yes, he did. He, Doug, Doug had, actually he did leave on his own. I just but uh, I was. You would leave on your own. I think own we were all well. paranoid at that point. Well, we're, we're all paranoid. Like, oh, you know, it's early uh, yeah. next. <laughs> but he leaves you alone. Yeah. Mike Nichols directing. I'm in, and I asked the cast members. So what do we? You know, does he does he tell you what to do? He says no. He wants you to do what you want to do, mm -hmm. and then he'll correct you a little later. Mm. And I'm okay. And what what came of that is everything that's on stage is an organic scene change so it just really flows together and it and it's a, such a tight ensemble because he let us play together your experience too Sada he Absolutely. let you really play this in this mm -hmm. wonderful broad way that you send up all of these <laughs> very, genres very and these broad. female performing styles that you do yes I basically just took a chance I mean I didn't really know how far to go but they I was never used to just being you know let go let go because like we, had that. A, we had you know we have a playground yeah. And, and and they let us play on our playground. And so that's much freedom. So much but freedom. But the beauty is that at the end of the day, then he brings you back to mm -hmm. you know being truthful to what it is you're doing, even though you're you've got these broad now, how ways of bringing yeah. back. Now, how do you have truthful, truthful in something I like know, Monty you're in a, Python? You're in it's a very interesting. expensive forest yeah. with yeah, know. Right. You know, that a truthful? mud castle. Well, that's the that was the, how he explained know, it to of, us. It was it, it was an interesting situation. He said, "Yes, I don't know how you 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 can do this." He said, "I know it's difficult with this material." But Eric Idle helped a lot too. But he said, You are very, very serious people. 
doing very silly things. Mm -hmm. And just remember, always just play it real. Never wink at the audience. Don't send up the joke. Never do it. Play it straight. Mm -hmm. And if you notice the show, we don't really mm -hmm. send up. If we if we do, it's just because we're selfish, you know, people. <laughs> yeah, we want a cheap laugh. That you know, but, <laughs> but totally the, when Mike Nichols shows back up, at the, you know, he's in the audience. We're like, oh yeah, we're real. We're real. Right. Long right. day's journey tonight. tonight. Yeah, yeah, Long day's journey tonight. Mike's in the audience tonight, so play it real. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Uh, but for the most well, part, no, he, 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 he said, play it real. And it, and, and it was awkward at first uh, in the studio because we, we're just in front of each other. So we're, we're we, But we always laugh at each other. But when we got the audience, he was dead right. We had our first preview in Chicago, and we played it just that straight deadpan, almost just this is why, who we are, and these are, we, we're, we're these people. Mm -hmm. And we're saying really weird things, but we're saying them very genuinely and very straight. And the yeah. audience went out, fell out of their seats. I must say that works really, really well in the the. I think, to my mind, the best number in the in the show, the um, um, the song that goes like this, right. which is this brilliant tribute uh, to, <laughs> <laughs> to, 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 to the schlocky balance of Andrew Lloyd Webber. Um, yeah. And yet you guys play it. I mean, for all the world, you could be actually doing the Phantom of the Opera. You. That was that was another example of what Mike because when. Uh, like I said earlier, the kamikaze acting because that uh, I, I started re rehearsal one day and then the next day we had a run through. So I'm a quick study. I'm a quick study. And I was I was almost off book like by day two and I, uh, I, I'm really quick. Uh, but but uh, Sada and I I said come on let's go in the other room the let's go in the other room let's yep. go in the other room and then I just throw something on to make this song that goes like this make make it work. I, I really don't know what to do. We did it. The the cast laughed and fell out of their chairs. So you guys worked it out yourself independently we did, we, of Mike Nichols. Yeah, and things you know that just went because, away. Just because you know but I was trying to catch up and and uh, and then we we were goofy and we, we, we could goofy. not ma stop making each other laugh. And uh, <laughs> in fact, I think we almost laughed the other day. We we laugh often actually <laughs> we at, each other, at each other because, each other because and go, she gets a secret laugh. smile and I get a secret well, smile. Well, and sometimes you know we've got hair in we our mouths. You know, he's my got wig is like stuck to my teeth and it's really very glamorous. But but Mike, Mike, it's that kind of show, folks. Mike, Mike said, yeah. Mike said, he said, you know, you don't have to do any of that stuff. You have to just believe that you are those people in Phantom of the Opera yeah, or that's in one of those one of those big mega musicals. That's all you have to do is believe that. And the less you do, the better. Yeah. And he simplified the he whole simplified thing, really. Whole and, it, thing. and it works. I mean, the lyrics, you, sometimes you just forget to trust the lyrics and to trust the simplicity of yeah. what's there in the music yeah. already. What's there visually. I mean, so much of the show is what you get visually anyway, just in terms of the set and the costumes and, you know, the chandelier. Right. I mean, it's, it's enough. Now, how do you find the reaction, uh, I guess it's happening every night, of these sort of Looney Tunes Monty Python fans who know the script from the movie? I mean, I was there a couple of times, and they were sort of talking along with the show. I mean, this is just part of the, the, the game and the fun of it all, or does it yeah. seem a little odd to have these crazy people out there? I'm not really on stage for most of the Monty Python mm -hmm. bits, bits, so yeah, I don't yeah. really get to... And I think even when you're on stage, you sort of lose perspective. You don't really hear right. what's going on out there, but right. I've heard that. I've heard that but people it's, But quote, for the most part, you uh, would be able as, to as anyone, like the college kids or the guys that come to the, that know the movie, anybody that comes to see the movie, right. they'll be pleasantly surprised that a lot of that is intact, and so they will be respectful, but it's the strangest situation because they applaud characters like the Black Knight or the French right, Taunter. Right. Whereas, like, you'd be seeing Oklahoma. People don't cheer for Aunt Eller. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Aunt Eller comes to say, it's like, yeah, Aunt Eller, woo! <laughs> but here, you know, I'll come on stage as a Black Knight and, and they'll they're be like, applauding. Yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's, it's, it's like crazy. It's great. It's a rock concert. It's a rock I mean, concert. how would we? It's, so it's much fabulous. Fun. It is really just a lot. It's mean, a rock, we, no one has ever experienced anything like Absolutely. this. When did you? I'm always interested. In, when I'm always interested in my questions. When did you? <laughs> <laughs> when did you realize, though, that this was not just going to be, you know, sort of a, a normal, okay Broadway show, that this was going to become the phenomenon that's The first become. preview in Chicago when uh, the uh, portcullis went up and Tim, you heard the sound of oh, coconuts coming yes. through the bridge, through the middle, and it's Tim Curry and Michael McGraw, and Michael's going click, 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 click. There was almost, almost a standing ovation yeah. cheer that lasted, uh, had to have been like three minutes yeah, of people cheering. Of the crowd. They couldn't say their lines because the, the crowd was going bonkers. Mm -hmm. And Peter Lawrence, our, sta yeah, our, stage, our yeah, stage. beautiful, amazing Lucky stage man. manager, he, I was standing right next to his console, and he, and he said, I think we're going to be all right. <laughs> be okay. And you got that sense, too, when you yeah, were? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was going to say, personally, I felt that when I was watching Casey Nicola work on certain numbers, and, yeah. you know, just... Your choreographer. Uh, yeah. Yes, the choreographer. And when I would look around the room in rehearsal sometimes, watching numbers, just feeling like this is something special and not to be presumptuous not to assume anything about sales or whatever awards right, or anything sure, like sure. that but just in terms of the work and and just how silly and funny and how different it w was what we were doing mm -hmm. and you know 
That's when I felt it. <laughs> well, your hunch <laughs> turned out to be accurate. <laughs> um, Sara Ramirez, yes. Christopher Sieber, both from uh, uh, Spamalot. Terrific performances. Really some of the funniest work I've seen on Broadway in a long, Thank long you. time. Uh, those silly drama desk people who overlooked you should be oh. taken out and have their limbs Thank chopped you. off like yeah. the Black Knight. Thank, Thank you. And Thank we'll you. look forward to seeing both of you at the Tony Awards. Oh, huzzah, knock on wood. Thank